We're excited that you've dialed into our digital sermon series here at NBC for 2021. Our mission here at NBC is to help grow resilient, biblically rooted families. And to that end, the teaching of God's word is our primary tool of ministry. We trust that these teachings, these sermons will be an encouragement to you and your family. We also want to encourage you to check out all the different activities we have throughout the year that focus on teaching of God's Word for you and your family. So make sure you check out our website at MuskokaBible.com. We trust again that this season, this summer, these sermon series will be an encouragement to you. God bless. Well, thank you for gathering this morning. It's good to uh, be back together. At least it is for me. I'm enjoying the opportunity to just share uh, this text, this delightful little strange book, and uh, to be able to do so together. Um, yesterday, if you weren't here, I know this is one of the awkward things. If you stick this out and you're here every day, uh, you hear some repetition. And that's because of the nature of the where we are. There's a bit of, you know, there's a transient nature to things and people that weren't here or they come in for two days. And sometimes when we're jumping in through a book and today we're going to be looking at chapters three and four, at least we're going to stick our big hairy toe into four. We're not really going to spend a lot of time there. Um, and again, we're just looking at the highlights of this text. We're not examining every verse, but there's a need to just kind of step back a little bit and remember the context. So just allow me, if you will, if you've heard me saying these things, I apologize. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but you see, they're trying to keep everybody on the same page. We discussed yesterday the theme of this book, which is vanity of vanities, which of course means that this uh, idea of everything being futile, being substanceless, that everything is without purpose and meaning in this world uh, it, it, without God. I used an illustration yesterday of likening our universe and everything we know to being in the confines of a box. And in that box is everything that we've ever learned Everything that we could ever glean to understand within this world, it's in that box. You are in that box. Time is in that box. History is in that box. The future is in that box. Every aspect of education is in that box. And that was what we have been doing is rummaging through the contents of this box and trying to work out, is there some cohesion? Is there some way that these things go together? I mentioned yesterday in the second service that that is where the word university comes from. Uh, we uh, use the word university, which is a portmanteau of two words, unity and diversity. And we put these words together to see, is there a place where we can find, uh, we can study all of the aspects of what's in the box, all, all the diversity of the box, and find out if there's a unity to it, and try to bring some coherence to it. And we, this is how we educate ourselves. We understand the world around us. We know a lot about it. We like to talk a lot about it. But we're trying to figure out the overall picture. How does everything fit together? Does it even fit together? And of course, this is where philosophy comes in. Philosophy is an attempt to explain how all of these diverse things harmonize and become unified. And of course, we've lived through various philosophical ages. You may not know uh, much about philosophy, but the age that we live in is uh, directed, is steeped in, is led by a philosophical mindset. Whether we recognize that or not, uh, through the ages, uh, heavy thinkers, they come up with ideas. They write this down in a book. Six people read the book. And we think, oh, it's, you know, who cares? But those six people are influencers, and before you know it, they're the ones who are writing plays, and they're writing other books, and it seeps into fiction, and before you know it, it begins to be, uh, in, you know, talking about over tea parties, and it just filters down and becomes the main mindset of the people. So you may not know that you've been influenced by a philosophy, but we have been because the mindset of our age, the naturalism and the postmodernism of our age is steeped throughout everything that takes place. This is because we've examined the contents of the box. And as human re beings, we have reached the conclusion that there really is no conclusion. Currently, we're living in an age where we believe that pretty much anything goes. Do I need to tell you this? 
that pretty much you are your master of your universe. You decide what's right for you. If you would like to be a chipmunk or a chicken, you decide that for yourself. You make your own destiny. You choose what you want to believe because we've decided you can't really believe anything. Nobody knows anything. That is where we're at. And yet the book of Ecclesiastes speaks right through this nonsense and tells us very plainly the reason that they were not able to find any answers in the box. It's because there are no answers in the box. Vanity of vanities. Everything is vanity. So we're told in verse 3, this key phrase that we must keep in mind from from chapter 1. What does man gain at all the toil at which he toils under the sun? And again, for the point of repetition, that is the key phrase. And we'll see that all the more, how important that is as we look at a verse, a couple of verses in chapter three, that this unlocks the book. This is just examining life without God, examining just the contents of the box. Don't take the supernatural into account. Don't look beyond the horizon, if you will. Just our lives under the sun, just us. That's the way this book, only the way this book makes sense. Vanity of vanities. Nothing means anything except God. But if we exclude God and look at life under the sun, everything is meaningless. So we come to chapter three and I'm going to read to you uh, some of the most famous words uh, that um, you would ever hear. A part of scripture that everybody knows just about. Uh, secular or not, uh, this part of scripture is in the Guinness Book of Records as uh, the oldest song lyrics ever written. They're just over 3,000 years old, and they were borrowed by, and I forget who wrote this down, Bob Seeger, who cares? He was in a hotel room, he opened up his Bible, he turned to Ecclesiastes 3, and he mo- wrote a song. And if these words don't sound familiar to you, that's just because you're not old enough. Verse 1 of chapter 3, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Now, I just have to pause there to remind you that this is now a shift. Everything in this book is telling us and directing us to consider life under the sun. But now, for this moment, he is now going to step back. And he is now going to consider everything that takes place under heaven heaven. So now he's giving us just for a glimpse, just for a time, just for a few chapters. And then he switches back to under the sun right now. We're going to take God into account. We're now going to include him in this confusion of this crazy world that we live in and all the chaos of what the contents of the box and all that's going on in it. Where is God in the midst of this? He answers the question, A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. Let's just pause for a second. There's 14 couplets. I'm sure you're familiar with them. But what is going on here? He is talking about what is going on and what is taking place in life in the box. It's a time to be born and a time to die. Who chooses their time to be born? Well, pretty much nobody has any say over that. My oldest son was born by a cesarean. We actually knew his birth date about six weeks ahead of time because we had a medical issue in the situation and it needed to be. That's, that's rare. He didn't know. He didn't have anything to do with that. Neither did you. And a time to die. How many of you choose? I know we live in an age where you get to decide everything you want, anything you want. But by and large, generally speaking, for the most part, the human race has had no say over these things. These are things that happen to us, and as it were, we become the victims of them. We get thrust into this world inside the box, and we get taken out of it. Well, who's in control of that? Is it time to plant? Who decided what the season was? Who decided when you should put a seed in the ground? Did you get to decide that it should be in springtime, and whether or not you should wait for what rain? None of us are too agricultural, I wouldn't think. Most of you are from southern Ontario and you're like me. Chocolate milk comes from a chocolate cow. I don't know. And a time to pluck up. Who decided when we harvest? Who decided that? 
This is just we, us now subject to the nature around us and what we have to function with. Time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to da dance. What is this? First you're at a funeral, now you're at a wedding. Who decided these things? Well, it's just, it's just life. Wait, why now you're doing one thing, now you're doing another. Now, now you're sad, now you're happy. Now there's a baby born, now the baby dies. And, and you just have no idea what's coming. It's just one thing after another. This is the picture of life inside the box. It seems to our naked eye to be incoherent, to be, as it were, random. A time to cast away stones. A time to gather stones together. I'll just remind you that Ecclesiastes 3, 5, this verse, a time to cast away stones, time to gather stones together. This is the verse you write inside a get well card when somebody has had a gallbladder operation or kidney stone. Time to gather stones, time to cast stones away. What is that? That is just the idea of farming. You know, you, you have land, you need to harvest, and, and it's full of rocks. So, so what do you do? I mean, it's just a picture. And, and you, you take all the rocks and you pile them to the side. And then you say, oh, where are those rocks? We, we got to build a wall to keep the cows in or the sheep in or whatever. Well, what do we do with those rocks? You throw them out. All of a sudden, you need them. A time to embrace. A time to refrain from embrace, embracing. That would be the COVID verse of the age we live in. Time to seek. A time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. I mean, we don't all know exactly how all those fit in, but, but you understand the concept. First you're doing this, now you're doing that. First you're, you know, everything's great, now, now things aren't so great. And if you haven't experienced that in your life, I, I don't know where you're living, but this is the content, this is the expression of, of, of what we find as life inside this box. So where in the world is God in the midst of all this chaos? Does his hand have any way of sewing together any sense of unity from all this diversity? Is there a coherence in any way to all the nonsense in the world? I don't need to tell you. Uh, that there is nonsense in the world. Uh, I mean, just turn the radio on, the television, listen to the, uh, you know, read the internet news, whatever you like to, to tune into. And you know quickly, I mean, if it isn't the Taliban, it's, it's COVID, if it's whatever, it's the next thing, it's another thing. It's always something. We, we have expressions in English, don't we? Out of the frying pan, into the fire. Why, why do we have that expression? If it's not one thing, it's another. Why, why do we talk like that? And, and, you know, we get this Eeyore attitude. It goes from bad to worse. Why are these normal expressions to us? Because this is our human experience. Not every day. Oh, well, there's a time to mourn and a time to dance. But what's the thread that holds any of this nonsense together? Is there one? Well, it's interesting that the scripture here in chapter 3 uses this concept of time. It talks about a time for everything. Well, where did time come from? This is a very philosophical question, and I don't, don't understand time, but it's a great, fascinating discussion. Time. We're caught in it. It's this flow of time that moves forward. You always look backwards. Where, who invented time? Well, from a biblical perspective, it was God, of course. Let me read a few verses to you from the New Testament. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you because it hates me because I testify about it that it works, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to the feast for my time has not yet fully come. It seemed that Jesus lived his life with a concept of a checklist of things that needed to be done at a specific and particular time. Matthew 8, 28. When he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? 
So even evil spirits recognize that there was some sort of a checklist of something on God's agenda and the time had not yet come and they knew it. And so they were calling Jesus onto the carpet. You can't do that. The time is not here. Matthew 16 verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. Be raised. He knew there was a specific day for the crucifixion. There was some sort of clockwork that he was working against. There was a hand behind all the random events that seemed to be taking place. But at the time of Jesus, he knew that there was some greater framework that he was a part of. Acts 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. This is a Christmas verse. When the fullness of time had come. It seems from scripture we see very plainly that to us, Life seems it has this incoherent randomness. We're over here, we're over there. But truly in the greater picture when we look at life under heaven, we realize that these times are in the hands of God. And what the writer in his poetic style is pointing out to us is that in all of what appears to us to be just happenstance and confusion, that there is actually a coherency. There's actually a unity. There is actually a hand behind all the chaos in the world and all of the upset in your life, that there is actually purpose and reason to our eye. It seems incoherent. It seems confusing. It's so puzzling. It leaves us with questions. We always want to ask why I was visiting one of our Women at our church, families at our church, she's suffering from cancer, not expected to have a great prognosis. She just came through a chemo that nearly killed her. She decided to stop it, and she knows that deciding to stop it will be the beginning of the end. And she said, we just ask why. You know, I just have my time. She throws herself at the mercy of God and the sovereignty of God, but she can't help but ask why. So what's the answer why? Why does everything just seem to be so chaotic? Well, the book of Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes, gives us just the briefest of glimpses. And if I can say a, an answer that I think is delightful, but will satisfy very few people, because we're far too arrogant to submit to the sovereignty of God. We think he should serve us and run the universe the way I think the universe should be run. How many atheists have you met that say, I could believe in a God if uh, there wasn't all this chaos in the world. If there's a God who's in control or a God who's loving, then why doesn't he do something about it? Well, my answer to that is, well, you're not in charge. So you expect the God of the universe to run the universe the way you think it should be run? Because you know how the entire work of the world should work? How arrogant are you to think that you can decide that God doesn't exist just because the world looks like it's in chaos? Back to Ecclesiastes 3. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and do good as long as they live. Also, I bad. I, I thought I, this isn't right. I skipped some verses. Verse nine. I have to read this in context to make it make sense. What gain has the worker for his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. That's now it's here. Now it's this time to plant a time to sow time to reap time to tear a time to sow. Okay. I've seen all the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful. In its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. 
yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So we have eternity in our hearts that makes us look at this chaos. And that is why we always want to go back and ask the question, the human question, why? Why, is thing, why are things the way they are? Why is this happening to me? Why is the world in such chaos? Why? Eternity is in my heart and I know there has to be a reason. There has, this has to make sense. There's got to be some way to bring unity from all this diversity. What is it? Well, here's the answer. God has done it. Man cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. You're not going to know. You're not going to understand the mystery of the unity of the diversity that's found in the chaos of the box will never make sense to us. Now, I know that's not comforting to you, but it's if on one level, just, just accept it and understand it. That's what the Bible tells us. We're never going to grasp what God is doing and why he's doing it. I know this is not satisfying to the human condition. And we somehow feel that God is obligated to explain his actions to me. He's obligated to explain why he's done what he's done. I shared with the young people last night, uh, which I'm going off script here, but I'll just mention to you quickly. I've had some measure of tragedy in my own experience. And there are questions in my background that leave me wondering why. How come? What is the deal? I didn't have a normal childhood by any stretch, and you don't need my sad story, um, but I, I am basically, for all intents and purposes, an orphan. I grew up most of my life without parental influence or parents. I uh, just uh, tried to figure out why, why my family was medical reasons. Uh, my father had brain cancer. My mother had heart issues. You don't need, again, the details. Who cares? It's ancient history. Uh, truthfully, I, ironically, uh, the first, I thought of this yesterday when I was uh, here for the, came into this field. I sat in a chair in this field um, in 1977, uh, and while I was sitting down, my mother was going under the knife for her first um, heart surgery and uh, came through, ultimately didn't uh, bring a good end result, but um, I just thought of that yesterday, and here I am rambling to you, you could care less about my story. I'm just trying to say, I can... I'm, if it means anything to you, I'm not just spouting this off. I'm not just trying to be a preacher here. I am looking for answers too. This is one of the reasons that this book resonates with me. Because there are, con, there is confusion in this world. And, and the book tells us you cannot find out what God has done. But is God's hand in and through all that is going on? That is the joy of our worldview. That there is a sovereign hand. That though we do not understand it or see it, it is there. He is weaving some measure. Of, he's got an end goal. Jesus said it to his disciples that when the end will come. That's, you know, Matthew 24, uh, Luke 21, Mark 16. He's talking about final things. That word end means the word maturity or completion. It's like God has a checklist of all the stuff that has to happen. It's not random. God has, he knows he's got a target and everything that's going on in the world is a part of God's great target for all things. I perceive that there is nothing better for them, human beings, for them that, than to be joyful and do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Rejoice in your life. This isn't meant to be depressing. This isn't a point of which we should now check out. He tells us, you're not going to understand it, but just go on and eke out all the enjoyment you can out of life. Don't give up. God still has this. Just enjoy life. I perceive that whatever God does, endures forever. Whatever God is doing, it's part of his plan. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been that which is that which is to be already has been and God seeks what has been driven away I've sensed that I'm starting to get boring this morning I need to 
speed things up here. Uh, I'll just point out to you that verse 15 that I just read to you, uh, that which is already has been, that which is to be already has been. This is one of the strangest verses in the entire Bible. And you will read every commentary you read about this verse has a different idea about this verse. So I'm not even going to touch that verse. And you can read it for yourself and noodle it out and try to scratch your own head on verse 15 of chapter 3. God seeks what has been driven away. Okay, just read it and pray over it. Okay, that's my opinion. But here's verse 14. Nothing can be added to it. You will never fix or change what God has done in the chaos of our world. But God has done it so that people will fear before him. Why does, why is the world seem so random and chaotic? God has done it so that people will fear before him. When I was a child, I enjoyed mathematics up to grade five. I thought addition was a brilliant concept. It makes perfect sense. If you have two of this and two of that and you put it together, hey, that's a four. It just is so logical. It's so logical. It's delightful. Then I found subtraction and I realized how sensible subtraction was. You have a, a body of this and you take something away. Well, it's like, it's like multiple or, or, or addition in the reverse. This is just so sensible. I love it. Then I found multiplication. And I remember learning all my multiplication tables in grade four. And I realized this is brilliant. It's like addition on steroids. It's like you just take all of these pluses. And rather than put them all out there, you just put an X there. And you, oh, it makes so much sense. I love it. And then grade five came. And I learned that there was such a thing as long division. And suddenly I realized that math is stupid. <laughs> Why in the world would you take a perfectly decent number like a seven and chop it up into tiny little bits? So you've got this decimal and all these fragments hanging off the end. You just murdered this perfectly good number. And now it doesn't even, it's no coherence. It doesn't even make sense. You've got all these pieces and shards and they're falling over the table and the floor. And you're, how do you put them together? Where's my seven? Well, you divided it by six. And now you've got this, like, what is left? And you've got this repeated number. What does it mean it's repeated? Well, it just means it never ends. It never ends. So how do you take something that never ends and you put it back into this perfect number? It's just so illogical and stupid. That was the day I gave up on math. And I decided math is stupid. There's no other word for it. So I told my mother this one day as a child. I just came out with it. I'm not doing math. Math is stupid. She said to me, well, what are you going to be when you grow up? I don't know, but I'm not going to do math. She said, well, what about being a mechanic? Yeah, I'd be a mechanic. Well, you know, if you're being a mechanic, you know you have to know math. What? Well, there's all your wrenches are different sizes and lug nuts and bolts and whatever's going on. It's all size. It's all math. Oh, well, I'll be a chef. Well, if you know about measurements, you're going to need to know how to add a third of a cup and a quarter of a cup and whatever, blah, blah, blah. Oh, there's math. And suddenly you realize that the whole world functions on math. So I decided quickly, okay, math is not stupid. My teacher is stupid. <laughs> that is really the problem. If I had a good teacher, then I would understand long division. If I had a good teacher, then everything would make sense to me. It's not me that's the problem. It's the teacher that hasn't taught me well. Now there's a third option that people can take when they have a problem with math. And it is the option that I chose not to take. And it was the option of the humble heart that does the thing that every teacher wants its students to do. And that is to do this very strange human thing where we stick our hand up and display our armpit to our teacher and wait until we're noticed. And from a position of humbleness, you just say, I don't get it. And the teacher comes over and helps you and explains it and teaches you until you go, 
I, I don't get it. Now, I say that all that crazy nonsense to you to say that I do think that that is exactly what this verse is telling us. Let me read it to you again. I perceive that whatever God has done endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people will fear before him. God has done it so that people will raise their hand in humility and say, hey, God, I don't get it. God allows the chaos of this world to humble the human heart. But instead, all too frequently, we have people announcing publicly that God is stupid. That any notion of God obviously has to be eradicated because the world is in such chaos. We have a pandemic going on. Nobody loves to wear things on their face. Nobody wants to be told what to do. We have all kinds of wackadoodle ideas of what conspiracies are going on and all how evil the government is and what this all means and all the chaos that's being stirred up in the moment we live in. I don't know why, but I can tell you this. God has done it so that people will fear before him. So that people will recognize how frail their humanity is, how quickly they could disappear from this earth, how, how just a single invisible virus could snatch your life, just how important you should consider eternal things. God has done it so that people will fear before him. But oh no, they say God is stupid or they say this whole virus thing is stupid and they blame everything else and very rarely... Does the human heart get humble enough to do the thing for which God allows all the chaos of this world to take place? There are storms that happen that are so tremendous that they wipe out countries and homes and, and, and just decimate things. God has done it so that people will have an end of, of, of days experience so that they will recognize there is a power that is greater than them. There is something beyond them that they cannot control. There is life that can be snatched from you and all your stuff can be taken from you. And do you not fear the one who can do this to you? And oh no, we talk about how it's all this, that, and another thing and everything else. But the human heart needs to be humbled before God. Why is the world in chaos? Why does this happen and that happen and another thing and then this and another thing? I don't know. But here's what I can tell you. God has done it because, so that men will fear before him. And we will never, we, eternity is in our hearts. We want to know the answer. But all we know is this. God's sovereign hand is inside the box. Weaving together all the craziness and the I I incoherency. And he has got something that he's doing. And we are caught up in it. And sometimes we don't have the answers. And sometimes we don't ever see the answers. All we know is we trust the hand of the sovereign God who can enter our box because there is no lid on it. And who can do what he wants with his creation, how he wants it, and we can do nothing about it. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. Now, I got to remind you that this is, uh, these are, this is the text that one of the texts that give this book such a reputation for almost not being put in the canon. But remember, this is the perspective of life under the sun that we, them, we ourselves are but beasts from a human perspective. We're just like, animals what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same as one dies so dies the other they all have the same breath man has no advantage over the beast for all his vanity all go to one place all are from dust all to dust return this is not denying the afterlife this is just saying from a human perspective god gives people a vision of the animal kingdom and how fierce how brief life is, and we realize, we should realize, the human heart should be humbled before God enough to say, just like everything in this world, we're just like that. 
We could just be gone. I used to have a dog. I had a cat. He lived 13 years. He lived 17 years. Now he's gone. That should be a reminder to every human heart. One day that's me. One day I'm going to be in the ground. One day I should take stock of my life. Is there anything beyond this world? Should I consider my soul? Is there a God? And these questions should come up to the heart of the human condition. That's why God has made the world the way it is. And they will stand before God one day and they will give account for the fact that they denied every opportunity that was given to them by God in the midst of the diversity, in the midst of the chaos, to ever consider him. God has done it so that men will fear before him. So you cannot expect, with all due respect, to find answers. You will never fully grasp what God is doing. He can step in, he can give you a miracle and change your situation. Or he can allow natural courses to, to run their way and you feel like you were abandoned by God. No, you haven't been. How dare you say that? There is not a single rogue molecule in this entire universe. God's hand is behind everything that's going on just because you can't see it. And just because it appears to be chaotic doesn't mean it is. God does it so that men will fear before him. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, the spirit of beast goes down to the earth, just humanly speaking. So I saw there is nothing better for a man that he should rejoice in his work for that it is, is his lot. For who can bring him to see what will be after him? Just a couple of verses from chapter four. Um, if you're depressed and you want to be more depressed, read chapter four. Um, that's what it's good for. It's just so discouraging because it just reminds us. And that's all this chapter is. It just reminds us of the horror of the world that we live in. Again, I saw the oppressions that are done under the sun. Behold, the tears of the oppressed. They had no one to comfort them on the side of the oppressors. There was power. There was no one to comfort them. I thought that the dead, who are already dead, are more fortunate than the living, who are still alive. Better than both. He said, who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. So in the midst of all that's going on, we recognize God's sovereign hand. But oh man, is it wicked. Man, is there oppression. Man, does evil have the upper hand. It's so discouraging. This is how the world will be. The Taliban will be wicked. There will be evil in the world. And there are moments and times when the oppressed will be so oppressed that it would be better if they had never been born. It would be better if they were dead than suffer and go through what is waiting for them. And yet here we are puzzled by it. So bewildered by it, and rightly so. How can God do this? I don't have an answer. I don't, the Bible never gives us an answer. Even Job never gets an answer. All we know is that God's sovereign hand is behind all things. I'll read these verses and close if I don't discourage you with them. Then I saw all the toil and all skill and work comes from man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. The fool folds his hands, eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and striving after the wind. So all that that's done on top of all the wickedness and all the evil, then on top of all of that, there's just the wickedness of the human condition that just does what it does to get ahead for itself. So all the world wickedness and then there's human wickedness on top of that. Man's envy, uh, his skill and work comes from man's envy of his neighbor. The fool folds his hands. He doesn't do it. He gives up. He completely surrenders. What's the point? That's not the right way. Better for a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and striving after the wind. It's the only encouragement we can take. Better to rest in God. And find his sovereignty than two hands full of struggling against all the chaos and trying to find the answers. I, I don't have quick, simple solutions to this problem of evil in the world. I, I don't know what it would be. All I know is what the book of Ecclesiastes unfolds to us. And all I can say is try to encourage you that in the midst of all the diversity and the nonsense of the, the oppression and all that is going on in the world and in your life. Trust God. Lean on him. 
Believe in his sovereign hand. Trust him for the outcome. Cling to Christ, who is our life and life indeed. That's all we've got. That's all we're given. That's all we're allowed. And God has done it so that men will fear before him. To him be the glory. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity just to spend a bit of time in your word this morning. Thank you for for this text and for the delightfulness of it. We just pray that you would make it all the more real to us. Enlighten our hearts in it. May we be all the more surrendered to your purposes and to your will. And Father, that we would trust you in the midst of all that is going on in the world. Help us, Father, to see your hand and to lean on you and to trust you for our future and to know that all things are running according to your time and your schedule. And so, Father, we pray that humble hearts would come before you in the midst of this chaotic world that people would be humbled to seek and to find that Christ is life and life indeed. To that end, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you to tiny pieces. We'll see you in the morning.